And our next bit, I think we can move to uh, now, is to hear from an incredibly important person. Although I must say I've never knew her full title until I just read it on this bit of paper that Ian gave me. And, and I have to say that the full title matches what I'd always understood to be how important she is within the European Union. It's June Lowry Kingston, and she's the head of a unit called Accessibility, Multilingualism, and Safer Internet. And June is the key figure in the Commission bureaucracy, in the Commission management, for looking after kids and the internet, basically. Uh, there's a lot more to, uh, to her role than that, but I think, I think you've either got it or will get it at some point. So at that uh, moment, I think I will stop, and I'm supposed to do this uh, to indicate that we're going to hand over to June. So June is re remotely uh, logging in from Luxembourg. Hello. Well, I hope you can hear me. Oh gosh, I just had a horrible echo there, so apologies for my slight shock there. Thank you very much, John, for that kind introduction. I'm sure, as you know, the longer the title, the less important the person. I have no illusions on that. But thank you, John, and thank you, EU Consent, both for organizing today's conference, as John said, really important, and for inviting me to talk alongside such illustrious speakers today. I really wish I could be with you in Athens, but I send you greetings from a rather gray Luxembourg instead. And I also must thank the European Parliament for their initiative to finance such a project. Without them, we wouldn't be here today. And the project brings together really all relevant stakeholders, as we'll see this afternoon, child rights experts, child rights organizations, academia, the tech companies, and of course, the project is going to actively involve children and families. Now, a lot of fine words exist about child rights, age verification, and data protection, and parental consent. But your aim to test a technical infrastructure with families across Europe is the real game changer in this project. Because as we know, actions speak louder than words, and such an infrastructure is needed now more than ever. The 2020 EU Kids Online findings from 19 countries, I think, across Europe confirmed what we all suspected. The majority of children nowadays reported using their smartphones daily or almost all the time. And in many countries, the time that children spent online in 2020 had almost doubled compared to 2010. No big surprise there. Now, the COVID pandemic may have changed and perhaps maybe even ended the discussion over screen time quantity compared to quality. But the way that kids use technology to learn, to socialize, to play, to interact has changed dramatically and irreversibly since 2010. The smartphones, the apps they use, the high quality cameras those smartphones have mean that ch child users nowadays are able to interconnect, to share with others, often without parental supervision or parental knowledge in a way that was never possible before. Now, I don't want to depress us all, this is meant to be motivational, but let me quote some extracts from the Commission's 2012 Better Internet for Kids strategy. So just extracts of actions. Industry is expected to implement transparent default age-appropriate privacy settings and implement technical means for electronic identification and authentication. Industry should ensure the availability of parental controls that are simple to configure, are user-friendly and accessible for all on all internet-enabled devices available in Europe. The tool should be efficient on any type of device and for any type of content, including user-generated content. The Commission intends to propose a pan-European framework for electronic authentication that will enable the use of personal attributes, age in particular, to ensure compliance with age provisions of the proposed data pr uh, protection regulation. And the Commission will consider legislative measures if industry self-regulation fails to deliver. Member states, not forgetting them, are invited to support industry efforts and follow up their implementation on devices sold on their territory and perform tests and certification cycles for parental control tools. So how did we do? Hmm. Well, clearly the problem is not new. 
but I think it's safe to say that progress has been slow to non-existent at scale, at least, over the past 10 years, even as the need for such tools has grown ever more urgent. Now, you may have heard of the UK Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse in Schools that was released this summer. To quote Dr. Rebecca Eglinton, Chief Psychologist for the Inquiry, she said that unwanted touching, as well as being pressured into sharing nudes, had become such a part of everyday life for children that, quote, to the point where they wouldn't bother reporting it. What children have said to us is that sexual violence is now completely normalized through social media platforms and through access to online pornography, end of quote. Increases have been noted in child-on-child -child sexual abuse and peer-to-peer -peer sexual harassment among teens with a damaging effect on children's development and children's relationships. And even if not yet the subject of any in-depth academic research, a link between access to age inappropriate online content and this normalization of sexual violence among teens seems plausible. In Belgium, the average child now receives their first smartphone at age nine. Now, when I was nine, way back in the previous century, soft porn was restricted to the shop shelf of newsagents. Any X-rated material was show sold in specialist shops for the over 18s. And the TV watershed at bedtime, say nine o'clock, just prevented children from viewing violent or sexually explicit content. How can we as policymakers offer today's parents equally effective and simple tools to ensure their child's development is not knocked off course by content that was never intended for a nine-year-old's eyes? And in this context, I'd like to applaud Apple for their efforts to confront this reality soberly and sensibly by trying to find a practical path to protect all users' rights. It seems clear to me that effective age verification and parental consent tools are essential to protect young digital viewers from content which is violent, sexual, or simply frightening. Now, in the EU, we take a technology neutral approach to age verification with no specific sim uh, system gonna be imposed. We want to encourage innovation and we want to encourage European innovation, but we can and we do set the rules for that innovation to be in line with European values. Our way is not the Chinese way, nor the way of total market deregulation. So EU consent puts into practice the existing specific provisions concerning minors of the EU's Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the AVMSD, and the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. The revised AVMSD requires video sharing platforms to put in place measures, including age verification and parental control tools, for, which, for content that may, and I quote, impair the physical, moral, or mental development of minors. And as more EU member states complete transposition, uh, ULEX, when I last checked, says 10 member states still have to notify, including Ireland, the Commission will carefully assess these national measures for their completeness and their conformity. With the mapping phase of EU consent now complete, you have a good overview of what practical solutions are in place in the member states and beyond. And it's safe to say the expectations are high for the system you are now developing. A pilot phase with over 1500 children, adults and parents from at least three EU member states will show if the system responds to the needs of European families and will also show that change is possible. As John said, gambling changed. It's the only type of content that we are aware of where really minors are not in scope. And if it can happen for gambling, why can't it happen for other types of EU co of content online? So we're looking at this also in terms of how we can support such measures. The Commission's recent proposal of a European digital identity framework amending the current EIDAS regulation includes a European digital identity wallet. This will allow users in Europe, for example, to prove their age without needing to provide additional personal information or share their identity card details with online service providers. We hope this will be a real game changer. 
and we hope that by October 22, the members and the Commission will have finalised the toolbox that will contain the architecture and reference framework. And this proposal is one of the reference points for EU consent. Since the call for EU consent was published last year, there have been other significant developments at European level. The Commission's first comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child was adopted in March, and this explicitly includes children's rights in the digital sphere. This spring, the Commission announced ambitious plans for the digital transformation of Europe by 2030 in Europe's digital decade. And this is built on EU rights and values with people at its heart, with a proposal of a set of digital principles, such as the protection and empowerment of children on, and young people online. The online public cons consultation on this closed just a few days ago, and we are now working on the contributions received. There are two important recent legislative proposals now being discussed in Parliament and Council. The Digital Service Act, which proposes obligations and responsibilities on all digital intermediaries in proportion to their size and their impact. And at a conference I attended on Monday, both Commission and Parliament seem confident that the political decision on the DSA could be in place by next summer. And a framework to turn Europe into the global hub of trustworthy artificial intelligence. Our goal is to guarantee both the safety and fundamental rights of people and businesses while strengthening AI uptake, investment and innovation across the EU. So in this context of existing and proposed legal tools on protecting minors online, to respond to recent technological developments and the cultural changes they have brought, our Better Internet for Kids strategy will be updated in 2022. This strategy will act as the digital arm of the comprehensive rights of the child strategy to help children enjoy their digital rights in full. Consultation work has started with targeted groups of children and young people, including those with disabilities and other vulnerabilities, as well as with teachers around Europe. We've sought their views on what they see as important in the digital world, what challenges and opportunities they uh, identify, and what should change and how. And soon we turn to targeted groups of researchers, international organisations and industry representatives. But we have also just launched a more public consultation aimed at parents and carers. And I warmly invite you all to take part in that. We'll put the link in the chat and this survey is open until the 11th of October. Our Safer Internet Forum on 6th and 7th of October this year will also concentrate on the Better Internet for Kids strategy update. Under the theme, Shaping a Digital Decade for Youth, we'll explore how to make Europe's digital decade fit for children and young people. And registration is still open for this online event if you want to attend. We know that even implementing effective age verification and parental controls would not be a silver bullet, eliminating all online risks for children at one stroke, but it would make a big difference as it did for gambling. It's not easy. If it was easy, we would have done better over the past 10 years, but it's better late than never and change is needed for the children growing up online today. So I wish us all a very fruitful con conference this afternoon and thank you, E, your consent for your work so far. Back to you, John. Thanks very much, June. Uh, 